Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Nine meeting. I'm uh, calling it to order. It's 1 30. And the first thing on the agenda is introductions and roll call. So I'll introduce myself. I'm Wayne Peterson. I'm the chairman of the committee. I have served as county at large representative, and I've served in the community for a long time now. Brendan? Mm -hmm. um, yes, Brendan Clark, um, secretary of the committee, um, county staff, uh, water resources engineer. And uh, I do want to just introduce uh, Josh Porter, new engineer um, in the regional unit in the division, or the, um, a little group that I supervise. And so he'll be helping out just like May has been. So I wanted to introduce him as well. Yeah, uh, Joey Style, County Public Works, Water Resources Division. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. Jenny Williamson, uh, Public Works. I'm sorry, your name? Jenny Williamson, Public yeah. Works, Water Resources. I'm John Hall. I'm the Stewardship Director for the Land Services, San Luis Obispo, and I'm an alternate for County Public Works. Hey, I'm Janet Andrews. I'm Ryan Nelson, Vice Chair and uh, City Public Works uh, City Engineer. Michelle Carson, at representative of City Council. Mr. Mullen, uh, City at Large. Nadine McGill, the County Public Works. Josh Porter, as Brian said, Public Works Water Resource Division Engineer. Chelsea Moore, City of San Francisco. Uh, supervising some of our public works. Lucia Pullman, Sustainability and Natural Resources Analyst, City of Slow. Freddie Ice, City Biologist. Well, we're represented by the cat by the city. That's right. <laughs> we have four members here. Yep. We do. So we have a quorum. Next item on the agenda is the minutes from the April 12th meeting. Does anybody have any comments or questions regarding these minutes? One just minor um, edit to it on the under the uh, Rundo removal part of the minutes. It says the GA Hall provides a verbal up on the Rundo removal activities. Just to change that or to update. Wasn't a thumbs up or was it just a verbal up? Yeah. <laughs> sure it's not. Up on the Rorundo, yeah. <laughs> Update, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments? Well, I have a comment, and this is just my granny grammar thing, you know, sorry, sorry, but um, I noticed all over that people, it, it says so and so motions, motions, and, and actually people move. Motion. They make a motion. They make a motion or they move mm -hmm. that yeah. move to no. Okay. So that's just that, that's just language. <laughs> okay. But uh, if that's all, I will move the separate minutes as I'm gonna make a motion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna make a motion that I move. <laughs> Now we accept waiting. the minutes with the uh, correction that John has made. Is there a second motion? Okay. Motion made and seconded. Any other questions on the motion? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion passed. It's approved as corrected. Uh, item three is a discussion of the purpose and history of Zone 9 and the advisory committee. Uh, I was asked to, to do this one. And it, it'll take me a while to go through this, but I, I, I mean to make this as kind of an educational uh, event item, particularly for the younger folks over here that are new to the program. Uh, Zone 9 has existed for uh, since the mid 1970s. At that time, it was voted into existence by the public in Zone 9, and they established a tax rate for it. So it was a taxing entity at that time. Um, original Zone 9 was established uh, as a result of two significant flooding events in the city of San Luis Obispo. In a little while, I'll pass a, graph, a chart around to you so you can see the significance of those events, at least as far as Cal Poly's ring gauge shows it. Um, zone 9 was established for the purpose of 
establishing data on flooding, to develop plans for addressing flooding, and to basically oversee and provide information for the entities, the government entities that wanted to do something about it. Zone 9 was not an, an entity that actually did construction. The county and the city did that. But Zone 9 would do studies. And the first study we did is this one, first waterway management plan, this is 1977. And uh, I was involved with that study. Um, and so it's that's a broad street by, by the freeway. Picture on the truck. Um, when Prop 13 came along, uh, initially the, the, the tax rate was eight cents a hundred dollar valuation for the first five years, and that was because we we're going to do the study that was going to provide for that. After that, it was supposed to drop to five cents a hundred dollars to provide an ongoing. A support uh, agency for the pub public agencies. Um, uh, Prop 13 came in and changed all that, and we ended up getting a percentage of the tax just that the county collects. This has led to some problems in the past where the county says, Oh, no, that's our money. We can do what we want with it. And the zone nine has come back and said, No, that was set up. For, we, were, we were a tax entity, which was to get that much money so we can do things with it. And so we, we have a fund set aside in the county budget each year for our operations. And we've been using it over, over the years for the studies like this um, to support the creek maintenance programs of the city and the county and to also uh, contribute towards some construction projects that the city and county are doing. Uh, so that, that's basically what we're about. I want to read a paragraph out of the second Water Management Plan that was adopted in 2002. So this is the second one. Uh, and this is a response to the first one, basically. It's, this is the background. So it's a long history of flooding in Slow Creek watershed. Damaging floods that occurred in 1868, uh, 1862, I'm going backwards, but 1884, 1897, 1911, 1948, 1952, 1969, 1973, 1995, and 1998. Even so, relatively few structural flood control projects have been implemented. The only major flood control project recently constructed within the San Luis Obispo watershed study area is located above the Los Osos Valley Road Bridge, where in 1978, as a part of Track 592 subdivision, East of Slow Creek, a private developer channelized San Luis Creek to protect future development from the 100 year flood. And for reference, it listed it from phase one report. That's, that's the one over there. Uh, the channelization consists of, of excavating one of the chan channel banks, alternating east and west, to form an in channel floodway terrace, leaving the existing channel bottom in its natural state and planting a newly, inf the newly informed newly formed banks. The floodway terrace has not been managed since construction and has accumulated several feet of sediment. It is vegetated with dense shrubby willows and uh, arunda. This has reduced the channel conveyance capacity in this reach from 100 year design to approximately 50 years. So this is at the overpass at LLBR. Above the overpass at LLBR, yeah. From just below that overpass up to Prado Road is where that is done. And from my experience, the 1995 storm, when it came through, caused horrendous damage to banks in this stretch of creek where we had a, a widened creek bank. And I want you guys to think about what we're doing on the Hero Street and the Hero Street project. Same kind of project. The east side of the bank got eroded. We almost lost houses there. We almost lost a part of the sewer plant there because we didn't design into the project significant, sufficient erosion control for it. We assumed that by widening the creek out, we would slow the velocities down and the lower the water levels. In fact, what we did is we increased the velocities at the upstream end of it, where the channel where it was narrow and then it opened up, the water ate uphill or up, up channel because it was, the velocity was increasing as the water dropped into the widened channel. And then downstream along the east bank lost by Los Praderos, it washed out the banks on that side and almost, we almost lost homes there. 
And it did that because, again, the creek channel was dropped in one side of the, and the creek channel was right against that bank. And one side of that cha channel was not held back by any resistance. There was no planting, there was just water. And so the water shot through there and washed out the, the east bank there. And we had some severe problems. So these are things that the designers need to think about. And, and I don't think they think about those things too much. They, they look at a wide channel, a nice, pretty picture, and they miss some of the stuff. And so I'm really challenging the city as they're working on this new project to take a second look at your design. Be sure that you've got the erosion and control where you need it. Otherwise you pay a big price later on and a lot of confidence in the community will be lost. They see problems occur where you did all this work. Um, I want to pass around a neat chart. This is from Cal Poly. This is their historical precipitation data from the Cal Poly rain gauge. And I think the city's probably seen this one. Now, if you look at it closely, I don't think it's around. It's on the screen too, Charles. It's on the screen too. Okay, good. Okay, the little <laughs> vertical lines up there are the annual rainfalls. Okay. Those vertical lines of annual rainfall. If you look at it closely, you'll see the, the, side, the side that shows how much rain it was. It's 20, 40, and 60 inches. Typically, we get about 22 inches of rain a year. If you look across the graph, you see every now and then the lines get 40 or a little above or a little below 40. Those are the years we have flooding. Um, the big high one towards the, the middle, to the right of the middle there, it's, it's is 1969. That's one the here. highest one right there. That's 69. That's when about three feet of water went down Higuera Street, downtown. The next one to that, that's almost a 40, is the 1973 storm. And I was working downtown during that storm, and I watched the water come along the streets and come down Pismo uh, Street, which I was right next to, and it was up over the sidewalks there on Pismo Street. Downtown, we had a fire in the tower building and we had a fire truck sitting there with three feet of water, lightning and gas fire. Um, and you can see the last one line, the last blue line, that's this past season, 19 or 2022, 2023. And that's the uh, over 40 inches again. Now, that little purple line that shows below that that starts out of the left side of being at zero. And then they took and added and subtracted from that line. The number of inches of rainfall was above or below the average. So the first one you see is below the line because the, if you look above the blue line, it's below 20 inches. And so that's below. And so it shows that up until the mid 70s, uh, we were in a deficit situation. We were getting less than the average rainfall on average all the time. And then since 19, about 1980, 78 or 80, we're actually getting above the average. And, uh, but right now, this last year, we're at average again. So it's, uh, you can see that, that rainfall comes and goes. And there's one thing that's constant is change. It's always gonna be a little different, little something that you don't expect. And, uh, and it's important that in flood control, we recognize that, that uh, we can't count on what have happened in the past. You know, in the past, uh, in those early years, 1900 and there, uh, people in the city didn't believe the creeks were, were uh, big, or were, believe the creeks were too big. And so if you look down Higuera Street, most of those properties on Higuera Street, the property ownership is to the center of the creek. A lot of those people went to the center of the creek and put walls in there and built their buildings out to that, filled it all in and cut the creek in half. Uh, and I, I can, I, I was a surveyor my first four years here. I saw that information because I was surveying those properties. I saw where the descriptions were and I saw what would happen. Then down on South Lake Street, we were doing the Mid-High Gary Street project. If you look at the old records of construction plans down there, you'll find that High Gary Street was actually the top of bank for the creek. The properties on the west side of the creek were all filled so people could put warehouses and buildings on. And a lot of that fill was not just good solid dirt, a lot of it just trash. 
I was behind the lumber yard one time and they were digging there and they were coming up with old car bodies and all kinds of metal scrap and you, you name it was back in there. So that's an area where I've, you know, I've, I've talked about possibly erosion if we don't design the banks right along that area. You've got a good potential for it there because you've got unconsolidated soils. And um, just be aware of it. You know, I'm trying to pass a lot of my experience to you guys. Good time. Yeah, we, we have the 95% design plans we're reviewing right now. Yeah. So, you know, they, they put in riprap and erosion protective measures throughout, especially where the bypass channels mm -hmm. spread out from the main channel. Riprap's there, but in you know, some of these other areas that you point out, we'll definitely take them to care. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, the, uh, as I said, the most significant damage occurred in San Luis Creek during that storm in '95 was the in the areas where where the creek had been widened. Uh, and the reason why this was because of poor maintenance in the creek. It wasn't because the city wasn't doing their job. It's because the city didn't have enough resources to do the job. Um, I worked with Dave Romero on the, this, these programs all through my career there, and. With the budget we had, we hit the hot spots, the spots that were problems. And the other spots that didn't seem to be a problem, we couldn't do anything about it. So um, that area of, high, of uh, South Lake, uh, South San Luis Creek there was not maintained very well. Um, and again, we weren't aware of what the erosion effects would be on the creek banks. Um, Zone nine committee, our job, we report to the board of supervisors and recommended them flood control programs. That's our primary job. Um, we have the, uh, the document with us here, the purpose of the committee, which is in the handout to you guys. Just article one. Art, yeah, article yeah. one, that's the most important one, article one. It, it tells you about that we should advise the county board of supervisors concerning all policies relating to flood control in zone nine. And zone nine includes everything down to Avila, up Sea Canyon, up Fimo Canyon, uh, up the East Fork, up Bridgewater Creek, all these creeks. So it's, there's a lot of area there. And, and uh, normally we normally talk about the hotspots, the ones where people are complaining, but we need to be thinking about all those areas too and being sure that uh, they're being looked at so they don't surprise us later on. We need to be telling them, advising the board and probably advising the city council through our representatives on this board, what areas are of importance that we should be looked at. Uh, we should be recommending in item section two, recommending the board for specific programs to alleviate flood control. We do that through our budgeting process. Um, and item three, section three is the financing program zone nine. That's where we need to be carefully watching the funds that were coming to zone nine are being used appropriately for zone nine. And the staff brings us those budgets each year. We need to be sure that the money is not funneled off someplace else like they try to do it one time. And so, so what are we to do with zone nine? We're supposed to keep gathering the data, encourage an ongoing planning program. Um, so that's, that's our job is to really you know, tell these guys what we want and be, be as aggressive with them as we think we should be to, to get them to do what we think is right. <laughs> uh, you know, we shouldn't be just sitting back and approving what they say. We should be looking at what they say and saying, is this where we really want to go? Um, take some leadership in the thing. I even would like to see us uh, do an annual report to the Board of Supervisors where someone from the, this committee comes to the board and says, this is what we've done this year. And, um, so we get some standing in the community. But right now we're kind of a hidden community. Well, yes. May I say that um, the RAC does an annual uh, report to mm -hmm. the board and that includes that the chair puts it together with, with um, staff, but um, basically uh, month by month or meeting by meeting, whatever, uh, whatever actions, policies were taken during the year and is sent forwarded to, to the board. So I, I agree. I think that would be something that we could. If we did that, it would improve our standing with the board. Like exactly. And we should encourage maintenance. We should continue to work with the, uh, the staff of the city and county and encourage that they go out and maintain the areas that they've got, particularly where the areas that have been improved. And so we need to re-add it, uh, support those programs. 
And uh, the third item I got here is educate the public and our decision makers in what Zone 9 is all about and flood control. Because these, if you look at that chart again, flood, flooding happens not every year, not every five years, not every 10 years sometimes. It may not happen for 20 years, but when it happens, everybody would be on our doorstep wanting to the fix for the problem. So we need to be advocating for the program on, on an ongoing basis so that it doesn't get forgotten, it doesn't get swept under the rugs. And so we're, we're ready and we progressively improve things to relieve the, the flooding problems. And, um, and that would include, I think, also encouraging the communities to, in their development planning, where are they allowed developments? Uh, I know that uh, the Corps of Engineers has been advocating that areas that have been flooded and where they've gone in with, with FEMA and, and helped out people because they've been flooded out is that don't actually help them rebuild what they have and help them build someplace else. They're not in the floodplain anymore. Uh, that's a better program because otherwise it, you just keep fixing them every, every few years. So my, my recommendation is that we look at uh, our purposes and we really put it to our minds to, to try to uh, really advocate for flood control on an ongoing basis. I know some other agenda items we've got today are along this line. So I'm, I'm really supportive of those ideas. The next one is we're talking about uh, reviewing our, our flood uh, management plan. It's been 20 years since the current one was adopted and there's new ideas and new ways and better ways of doing things now than we have then. And there's also another item on the agenda talking about uh, an educational program, which I think Brent told me about that. I was, I got excited about that one. That's a good one. So anyway, does anybody have any other discussion on this particular item? Uh, a question, please. Um, when you started listing all of the areas and creeks that influence or, or actually come, come into um, the San Luis Creek, Rizzolero, Stenner, some of these are, are in Cal Poly property. And Cal Poly is state property, not city, not county, but out of our jurisdictions. But is there any coordination or inclusion of activities on Cal Poly's lands that Zone 9 actually has any control or say over or where those Creeks come through Cal Poly land. Is it just kind of no man's land and hands off for us? Why don't you ask that question? Um, <laughs> one of the items that, that we've talked about, I talked about last week, was that when Zone 9 was first established, we had representatives from Cal Poly. Uh, uh -huh. Doug Gerard was our, one of our representatives on the committee. We had representatives from Caltrans. Um, so we did have representatives from the major players in our community that are affected by the creeks and have control over the creeks. And uh, we don't have those representatives now, and maybe we should be advocating to try to get those people added to our committee, uh, maybe add two more positions on our committee, one for you know, trying to get Caltrans to, and try to get Cal Poly to have someone that would come to our meetings and represent them. Do you know when those groups or organizations were dropped or dropped out? In the late 90s, they did because uh, they just weren't involved. They weren't interested. And they had nobody that was, was interested. And so they, that's when we adopted these new bylaws, uh, we took those out, those positions out. But originally they were there. We had- um, uh, they're, they're noted in the yeah. intro to the watering management plan, yeah. as well as, as participants. So that stuck out to me as well. We, we did have representatives from a lot of places that we don't. We had or we had a representative from Apple at the time too. In the first zone nine, they were here. Yes, sir. So to address your point, Christine, um, we are working with a nonprofit called Creek Lands Conservation. Um, Stepwald used to be a member. I don't know if she still is or not. Technically, is technically is still a member. So um, one of your members um, is working on a Slope Creek watershed resiliency and rewilding plan. Um, so focusing on steelhead. Um, so we've been you know, heavily involved with that as they do identify different areas like Cal Poly or um, Caltrans property, city property, private property, trying to figure out what restoration actions should happen there um, to prevent a lot of what you were mentioning before when is this bank erosion and stuff like that. So one thing that I've seen in my tenure with flood control is creeks are incising 
from all these flow events and whatnot. So that incising or the deepening of the creek channels creates these vertical creek banks, which are unstable and continue to erode. So <clears throat> looking at where we can install fish habitat features like rock weirs. So we're gonna stabilize the grade and try to build it back up um, carefully, not too, too much, um, but just to stabilize those banks. Um, and like I say, we're looking watershed wide. Um, anywhere a fish could get to, um, we've got Stillwater Sciences on board, or they do, um, to look at the hydrology, the engineering, the hydrology, um, all these other kinds of factors um, for creek protection. And so they should be done with that plan next year. Um, and then we can have basically a sister document to the waterway management plan for more of the fish eye conservation restoration point of view. And then we'll have if, if we go through an updated waterway management plan, more contemporary flood control engineering-ish document to basically blend together so that we can plan for the next many years. So yes, um, we, we are looking everywhere. Should that someone from that group be a part of our committee? Is that Paul? Mm -hmm. I think she already is. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, um, I'll, I'll touch base with her and see what her availability is or encourage her to do that. Because that would be a great update for them to provide as well. Yeah, I agree. So, that concept was supposed to be a part of the second update of the management plan. When, when we had the problems in 95, the course said they didn't want to issue us permits for individual fixes. Um, they wanted to see us do an overall plan that would address those issues. And I don't think we accomplished it. So I think that was the, the latest edition of the waterway management plan, which went through and identified specific areas for like a holistic approach. Um, and in there, there's a permitting strategy, which didn't work very well. Um, and so that's why we went back to the individual permit strategy for like spot fixes, if you will. Um, so now with, you know, more of a focus, um, especially after January, February, March storms, um, coming back and, and really looking at the current water we the plan and seeing, you know, what updates we can make. Um, we're undertaking three of the main projects that were identified in there. Um, San Luis Drive, um, Elks Lane, and the mid Bypass Project will be next year, um, in addition to a couple other fixes that we're looking at doing. So. I remember objecting to that. I have to be on council at the time. I think I voted no. <laughs> Not unusual at the time. But, um, uh, and Neil Havlick, of course, did wonderful work at that time for the city. But that plan at that time, as I recall, looked at using Highway 101 coming down the grade as a wall to block and flood Reservoir Canyon. Uh, as flood control, is that kind of been forgotten? Gone. Well, we're, we, we're not pursuing that project. Okay, well, I didn't hear you mention it. I was listening to the, closely to the projects you said you're but, pursuing, but I wonder if that, is that thing still in there? Yeah, it's in there. They got dropped back, back in the 1990s before I let the city was dropped. No, it was in 2002. In, in 2002, it was in it. When okay, we, well, and I, I, I objected back then. Thank you. Yeah. We looked at it back. I object too. I made a motion. I appreciate your consistency. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't you say no, you got to say no. <laughs> yeah, that, that project is problematic. Um, but, you know, here again, like I say, with, with the update of the waterway management plan and, and identifying current projects, because like I say, we're, we're going to check a couple of them off the list um, within the next two years. Um, which is going to be huge progress. And then coming up with a, a subsequent list um, to get us into the next five to 10 to 15 year planning window um, on places where we've seen the creek is starting to have more problems to Wayne's point about the incision, the destabilized banks, and all that kind of stuff. So, coupling that with the, the um, r, r plan, the recently seen the Wildly plan, um, that, that will help us unlock funding from the restoration um, grant funding world. In addition to more of the engineering type DWR um, funding capabilities for the water management plan. So, looking to expand our, our possible wider net of projects. I guess, as, as a summary of what this item three is, is 
Does the committee want to make any changes in the purposes or the membership of the committee? Do they want to recommend the staff come back with any kind of change in that because there is? It appears to me that the, the first part, the purposes are pretty stable. The membership should want to try to expand the membership. Let me just clarify again when it comes to this, if there's private property ownership and, and how Polly, in a sense, of being the state is a private property owner, but have there ever been any issues when the zone nine or the county, the city thought that center was an arrow up there needed some stabilization? Have, have, have there been difficulties dealing with Cal Poly? Even if they did not have a member here on this committee, have they been, as a property owners, amenable to working with any suggested projects that we might have? So we're still looking for projects up there. Um, I work quite closely with quite a, a, a bunch of different professors, um, hydrologists, and um, different folks like that focused on creeks and, and watersheds. And so, um, you know, hopefully we can continue to develop that before. As far as getting someone on the committee, I think a professor may be challenging, um, but I, I don't know. Um, but then trying to get someone from administration. Even more challenging. Thank you. Yeah, I kind so, of think that we're gonna get somebody from Cal Poly to come. <clears throat> um, but we're also working with um, another professor um, on a fuel reduction effort. So, you know, trying to figure out, you know, which department to work with, we might be able to get some representation from Cal Poly. Um, I'll start asking around and see what I can find out. But as far as access goes and all that kind of stuff, I've never had problems getting on a Cal Poly property. Yeah, I, I would hesitate to change our bylaws to try to get somebody from Cal Poly on, on our committee. Um, I know that in the last couple of years, certain Organizations have been dropped from the membership list of the RAC because we just didn't have somebody who was Camp San Luis, they weren't interested in coming, or couldn't send somebody. And Cal Poly, we don't have anybody from Cal Poly on the RAC specifically right now. So I, I would hesitate to make it a, a change in, in the membership at this point unless we have interest to, uh, from somebody who would want to fill such a seat now. Yeah, I would agree, especially if there's no real value added that we're seeing, if there's no need to bring them more actively along. We can always ask them to be involved if there's a particular project that we want to work on, which is mm -hmm. kind of what I think you're saying, right? Mm -hmm. so you would just approach mm -hmm. the folks that you need to based on the project. But if, if there's not an ongoing, benefit to it. I would ask about the Avila. It seems like there would be, it seems like they would have as a community a vested interest in participating in this, but it sounds like that hasn't been of interest to them. At least if they were involved in the past and they're not now, that there's no current interest. So I guess that's like more of a question to those of you who have engaged with them. Yeah, in my couple years in this role, I found that to be odd as well. Um, so we're, um, we just added uh, the a study in Avila as part of the ongoing updates here. We got ARPA funds to do, so I'll, I'll explain that at the, when we get to the ongoing updates. Um, but I, it's been, it has been a weird kind of separate, it seems to me it's been separate. They have, they have an advisory council to the board, mm -hmm. the Avila Area Advisory Council, it seems pretty involved. Um, so maybe it's just kind of created their own path to get to the board that way. Um, but I've, yeah, I, I've had a similar kind of like, oh, interesting, you know, but I think we're in a position where um, maybe we can, we can change that with a couple of the things we're thinking about doing. So maybe we just sit tight for now and not propose any changes. And uh, if the need arises based on some of these other yeah. Um, opportunities or projects that we're thinking of and 
that need arises, we can revisit. So the committee be open to the staff talking to these folks if they if they want to get involved, they can be able to get involved in so we get the communications. Nothing about without people. actually changing the yeah. bylaws. Yeah, and we can always bring people in. The, we have county at large and county at, at large backup people and we can fit someone in there too. But I think that the communications good. is really important that they know what we're doing and we know what they're doing down there. They're part of the same system. That they're, 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 we're raising money from them to support this program. Yeah. Well, and especially in the case of Avalon, yeah. it literally flows. <laughs> it all goes down here. Right? Right. So <laughs> we think that they would have an interest in, and so maybe maybe just by reaching out to them and 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 seeing if there's a if there's an interest in my bring them in and then we can look at changing membership and he might be interested in getting himself on an animal advisory committee <laughs> uh, meeting as a presentation about zone nine because the advisory body down there may not even be aware that this exists and this opportunity to uh, consider what's being sent down their way every year. <laughs> and, um, maybe uh, he comes up with an education discussion we're coming up with, perhaps. Any further discussion? Good job. Three. Good job. Good job. Thank you. Moving on to item number four. Yes, thank you. Right, I'll take it from here. Um, uh, there's been, um, so we, we didn't have a meeting uh, in June. Um, however, in the last few months, um, city and county staff um, has been meeting to discuss um, just potentially what, you know, what would a waterway management plan update look like? And I wanna piggyback off a couple of things that Wayne said, um, the purpose of the committee, you know, when it was formed in the 70s, is to um, collect data. And, uh, you know, it's one of the things there. And um, I think it's, you know, uh, a document that's 20 years old is, um, you know, maybe it's time to look at it and say, um, is it is the data in here need to be updated? Um, Part of the, the driver, I'll say for me, I guess personally with having these conversations is, you know, we have, uh, we finished the study of the East Fork and, um, you know, so from the county side, um, besides, uh, you know, our, I would consider our limited pilot creek maintenance program, you know, there were not, we didn't have any, we don't have any active studies going on, you know, in zone nine. And I'm thinking, okay, what's, what's next? And um, I, I think they're, you know, ask city staff, there was a feeling of, yes, we need to talk about what's next too. Um, this is just, I guess, to be uh, fully transparent, this has included Freddie and Lucia and uh, May and Brian and then Nate from the community development um, and, I, and some of the environmental team from each side. Chelsea, did you make a meeting or two? I forget, I don't know. Okay, well, in spirit. Uh, <laughs> and I, I want to share what we're sharing today is um, the things we've discussed. So this is no like this is not a concrete. Here's what we're doing. This is a here's what we've been discussing the last few months. We're sharing it with you. And um, as Wayne said, one of the main avenues that this committee advises the board is through the budgeting process. So what we're presenting today and what we've been talking about is leading toward a budget request in October to hopefully start on a few of these items. Um, it is not going to be, the plan is not a big giant request to do everything, it's it's a request to get started. So just, that's our idea right now. And so I just wanna show that that's where this is going. Um, but obviously we want your thoughts and your input as Wayne has explained. Um, so uh, as we know, the waterway management plan uh, as it is, is you know was created in the late 90s early 2000s adopted in i think 2003 um and there's been changes there's been projects built there's been um, changes to the creek there's been changes um 
ecologically, biologically, um, like we're talking about banks eroding. Um, there's been changes in model techniques um, and in programs um, just across the board. There's been changes to permitting in the regulatory environment. Um, and so these are things we know that's going into um, what we're trying to tackle um, with a potential update. Um, we want to, and we want, we know that there's a number of stakeholders to be involved, um, and I've listed some here. Obviously, includes this advisory committee. Um, there's the Slow City Council, our County Board of Supervisors, City and County staff, um, the constituents specifically of Zone Nine, um, and private parties, businesses, developers, and of course the public um, as a whole. So. When we talk about, well, what would a waterway management plan update include? Um, these are in no particular order. Um, some of the things that uh, we have um, come up with, and I'm gonna go through each of these in detail uh, or with a little more detail. Um, this is to incorporate and reflect climate change. Um, this is uh, obviously, we have changes in runoff and rainfall um, that we um, should plan for to the best of our ability. And also, you know, when it comes to funding projects, when it comes to state grants, you know, this, we have to show um, how this is in our projects and everything. So that obviously this is really important. Um, we have leveraging new data by others. Um, in the last 20 years, there's been a number of studies, models, projects, et cetera. Um, understanding what has been done is, uh, as you'll see, I think is the first step to um, looking ahead. Um, another thing we've discussed is developing an updated flood model. Um, we've talked about flood forecasting tools as it relates to public safety, modernizing data sets, um, evaluating the management projects in volume one, updating the drainage design manual, which is volume three, expanding the stream monitoring network, and engaging the community. Um, so I'm going to go through a couple of specifics of what I mean by each of these here um, real quick. So um, incorporation and um, reflecting climate change includes identifying um, potential future hazard zones, as um, the city has done some climate modeling on top of the existing um, waterway management plan model, and uh, you know there's there's a lot more information available on uh, what we could expect um, when it comes to changes in rainfall and runoff. Um, leveraging new data by others, um, this is aggregating and summarize the completed project studies and more um, done by city, county, um, and other public and private entities. You know, I'll just like, um, John, I'm gonna pick on you. Like with the Land Conservancy, you know, and the Arundo work, you know, understanding everything you've observed and seen, you know, that's that's valuable information and inputs into what we're doing. Um, Freddie mentioned creek lands and the um, Slow Creek Resiliency and the Wilding Plan. Um, there's there's a ton of stuff going on. Uh, Sam Maliglio, Mutual Water Company is rehabbing the weir there. Um, so there's a lot of information and data specific to that. Um, I'm just giving a couple examples of, there's not right now a comprehensive list that we've been keeping of all the changes in the information that's out there. Um, so we think this is something we wanted, would like to do. Um, then there's developing an updated flood model. Um, and this is a both a hydrologic and a hydraulic model. Those I know there's a big terms, but it has to do with the quantity of water and um, how much and how fast and what is the flow of the water? How high is the creek getting at certain rainfalls? Um, there's been um, significant improvement to the programs and the techniques um, in modeling. And this is something right now you could go onto the city's website and download the models from, I believe it's 2000, the 2007 update um, and that's the basis of, um, of some of uh, the develop the, the development community uses in the city and in the county. Um, you know, these are, this is what's available to them, and um, we think we can. Uh, it's probably time to update that and get get a fresh look out to everyone when they're doing their projects. Um, another idea here is the flood forecasting tool for public safety. Um, again, this is intended to form um, first responders and emergency coordinators. So if we have a model um, and we have stream and we have rain gauges, um, is there something we could do um, where knowing we have a certain amount of rainfall coming in or we know 
the like thinking about January 8th, the soils were completely wet. The streams were already flowing. Um, we could, I think with some modeling, we would be able to expect, hey, what are the chances here? Marsh Street's gonna, gonna flood like we saw. And maybe we can get people set up and prepared 24 hours in advance instead of after the fact. I think that's something we could do um, and could be involved in this update project. Um, another, uh, so modernizing data sets. Um, this would be, okay, we've looked at what has been done already. What are the gaps and what do we need to go get? And so this would be going and collecting new information, um, which could be used for a number of purposes. It could be used as new baseline assessments for environmental documents like EIRs, um, like if Freddie needs to go get a new permit from uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife or Regional Board, you know, 20 year old baseline assessments, um, might, it's gonna be time to have those updated. Um, it also, these data sets are used in the model as well. So the condition of the creek um, is really important when, when we're trying to model how much flow, how fast um, is it going, you know, knowing how dense the vegetation is in the creek, what kind of um, condition the banks are in um, is really important. And then, as you can imagine, a number of these topics and ideas will help inform um, the project list. So as Freddie's mentioned, we have a number of couple of projects from the current water management plan are um, being done in some way, shape or form via emergency work from the flooding. I mean, no mid Higuera bypass project is, um, I'd say really close. Can I say really close uh, <laughs> to, your, to being implemented? There's significant funding, 95% uh, plan. Some of the permitting is in hand. Um, so what, what's next um, for projects? Which, what are, um, what's the new, you know, assuming again, these all are done, you know, what's the new priority? What should we be working on um, as, um, as zone nine? There's updating the drainage design manual. Um, so um, Hal Hanula, who's retired now, he um, was, he implemented this drainage design manual for its entire life, I think, so far. And uh, he has a number of thoughts about, you know, and comments about what, um, you know, some changes that could be made to modernize it and to make it, um, you know, just more, uh, more applicable to today. And we also know uh, there's a number of other overlapping requirements, city, county, regional board, state, um, and, you know, how does this document fit or not fit with those right now? Um, aligning with those other requirements, uh, or at least recognizing them would probably be a good update. Um, and so I think this is something that, you know, again, this, as staff, we think this is on the table um, for updating. And lastly, um, we have expanding the monitoring network here on the screen. The green dots are our rain gauges um, in the watershed. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't put the watershed on the map. I'm not good with the maps anymore. And, but the green are the rain gauges and the yellow are the stream gauges. And um, they're, you know, we know, in discussion um, with the city, you know, we think there's some gaps here, uh, especially in the Perfumo area leading into Laguna Lake. And then as, as county, as you can see, there's nothing um, south, really south of the city limits. Um, you know, we don't have anything. So I think these are, when we're talking about trying to understand flooding in the stream and, um, you know, perhaps some additional gauges um, could be helpful um, for us moving forward. And then the last topic we've discussed is in engaging the community. Uh, obviously, that, I think that starts here in the advisory committee. Um, there could be some special events, which we have one to share in the next item. Um, but this also could include making sure we really get the word about, about it, like a groundbreaking ceremony um, for mid Hygera um, or other events um, as appropriate. And then to another thing, it would be you know, doing press releases um, as again, I kind of as appropriate. So if we are kicking off a new project, or um, uh, see, we have a, even a special data set come in, or I don't know, maybe it's a way to help um, get the word out. And um, again, the the staff teams uh, think this is a uh, going to be really important moving forward. Um, so those are the items we've discussed, and I wanted to share one last thing. And um, there's a lot here. 
and the colors are all washed out, unfortunately. Can I move this? Do you know? You think it'll go away? Sweet. Okay. Good. The years don't really matter. I'm just going to cover those up. Oh, and it goes away. All right. So, um, what this is intended to show is that a number of the items um, that we've discussed are connected to are, or are dependent on um, one another. And so what we've identified in our list is that there's kind of five tracks of uh, this potential update. Um, obviously, we think a flood model update needs to come after understanding what data has been made in the last 20 years and filling any data gaps um, before a model. So that's this top track. Um, and the stream and rain gauges, you know, something we could start now or soon is what's the process for adding new gauges to the county network. Uh, another kind of track is we do have existing models. We have, we already have some rain and stream gauges. Could we start a flood kind of warning system now? Um, and then obviously after a whole new data set and new modeling that could be revisited. Um, the drainage design manual is also um, potentially its own kind of track. We, there could be an update to that based on just to modernize, you know, uh, the, the data sets that are in there and some of the comments from Hal and others who have um, been using this document, you know, and then perhaps in the future, there's a, a more wholesale update based on everything else that's been done. And then the projects too, um, after, you know, we think it's after a flood model update, um, after maybe the stream gauge network, these could all potentially lead into a new project list, which I think is, again, we think is more appropriate to start that kind of discussion when some of the current projects are done. Don't get too far ahead of yourself. Um, so again, wanted to show there has been a little bit of thought about how these tasks could fit together and that you know, we kind of see there are kind of five, four different tracks that we could get started on. And the fifth being the projects, which obviously are ongoing currently. Um, so I am going to go ahead and throw this list back up on the screen. Um, this list, and I will go ahead and turn it over and uh, we'll entertain any thoughts or comments, things we should add. Um, and um, yeah, I'm just really looking for committee and public input. Again, as we move toward, um, you know, a, a budget request um, that will come before the committee in October to hopefully get started. So, there we go. Any, any comments? Anybody? Yes. I'll just say that just from the top, this looks a, like a really good. These all seem like topics that I would want to see updated or you know modernized um i like the idea of um that last slide that you just had showed a little bit of a timeline mm -hmm. i think that's really helpful to have in the plan to help sort of show what the time frames would be for when some of these things we would, we would be looking to be to accomplish them um one of the things that we've included in a lot of our uh, more recent city plans that have come before me since I've been on council is um, in terms of like the project list, not only just a revised project list, maybe taking off some of the ones that were in previous plans that are not really relevant or best practice now anymore, but also maybe prioritizing them in some way, even if we're not setting aside or committing funds to them, but just saying, you know, given, given in li limited resources, because there's always limited resources, here's what we think is the most important project. And then from there, here's the second most or the third most. And then that is really helpful in planning, you know, in a five to 10 year way of where, you know, and then you can always go back to that plan and look and say, well, we've done this, this, and this, but this was our third priority. You know, let's do this one next. Even if somebody is, um, maybe looking at, you know, maybe you're getting public opinion that priority project number eight. Well, that gives you, you know, is important at this point. It gives you some sort of history of why we came to that project being number eight instead of number three to kind of um, 
help keep the focus in the right spot. Yeah. I want to add something. Add, something, add, add something, something real quick. Sorry. Yeah, I, two things I wanted to note just about our staff kind of thoughts I, I forgot to mention. Um, one is that we are not envisioning a new paper printed single volume. Um, we are, you know, we have been discussing, and I think there's some consensus, at least now, again, among staff, that you know, these are things that can be done kind of individually and, and kind of hosted on, you know, like on a waterway management plan website or, or something like that. that. Here's the latest of this and this and this, and here's what we're working on. And here's, you know, where we expect to update, you know, over these years. Um, but right now, we're not thinking of a you know, a massive rewrite to the entire thing at once. Um, we've been kind of looking at a piecemeal um, approach. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to mention is that this approach then, um, we don't think at this point that any of these items will require an exhaustive um, environmental document as they're planning tools and they're not committing to any projects or um, anything like that. So that's something we're keeping in mind as well as, um, you know, are, are we, is this a process we want to go into or not? And um, we don't have to go into the sequel process if we don't, you know, reach certain levels of, you know, commitment planning, project specificity and things like that. So those are a couple of the things I wanted to, I thought were important to highlight that I forgot the presentation. Yeah. Um, in the area of community engagement, uh, two things that I noticed is that uh, we, People put up have, have floodgates they design for their buildings. How many people do you know where the floodgates are? And how to install them when they do get them and are they maintained? Um, that should be uh, an active program. Somebody needs to be generating. And the other thing is uh, when you hand out sandbags, you tell people how to use those sandbags. <laughs> I mean, I've gone and seen where people put them in and they do no good in it at all <laughs> where they install them. They, the sandbags have a certain purpose and and they just think throwing sandbags in front of a door will stop the water well steve was no <laughs> it just goes around them but we need to have education programs uh at the right time of the year and in the right places so that people will know how to protect themselves when the time comes thank you for that because that was one other thing that i was going to say about that about the community education piece is that um, the city just recently um, completed economic development strategic plan and one of the sort of pillars in that is preparedness based on the recent experience with mm -hmm. floodgates in downtown and people were using them in all sorts of ways but they mm -hmm. didn't know where to find them and so there might be some really good opportunities for a nexus with some of the other city departments on education efforts and to various populations including downtown businesses so i've got a pretty good rapport with Matita Swager, and so talking with her you know pre-winter time and kind of getting the word out from downtown slow um, specifically and having a training i think would be great with you know the, the, the memory of january 9th in everybody's mind keeping that you know in front of our mind instead of waiting you know a couple years oh you know it's not going to flood for another 20 years so uh, but you know i mean like i say making sure that the business owners know um where their floodgates are and how to install that quickly <laughs> Um, to Brendan's point about, you know, looking at this new um, gauging modeling system, um, if we've got 30 minutes, if we've got 15 minutes of advance notice, you know, folks could have to mobilize and hopefully prevent as much damage as, as possible with that notification system, but being prepared and having your equipment ready to go is key. And residents along that South Higuera corridor too, there are so many people that have so many significant issues with the BB Street and Parker Street. Absolutely. It'd be really nice to run before the season starts, kind of like how Freddie goes and clears the channel before the season is ready um, when we're doing community engagement. For, for us, the Wyoming Conservancy, we have a ban that's uh, overseen by the Department of Bank Safety. And so under our, our uh, emergency action plan, every fall we have to do a, a, a trial to go through the protocol and what would happen if we had a dam failure to make sure all the members with Office of Emergency Services work, that the numbers for downstream emergencies work. 
but it might be kind of a similar thing that we could do with the community of just you know, having a date where they they have the opportunity of being like this is this is flood awareness day and this is your opportunity mm -hmm. to check your flood dates and other things and make sure that we know where like during this last flood I know it was a lot of scrambling trying to find like, where do I fill my sandbags up there was locations all over the place but it was a little bit of a scramble figured out in the moment as your house is flooding so and there was sand and there, so yeah, yeah there was a communication and for there you have, to have your sandbags you provide the sand so yeah <laughs> do you pass out vinyl sheets of plastic to the sandbag no. that would really be helpful just really put the plastic down and put the sandbags on top of it that really seals it tight yeah, yeah. it's just sand <laughs> yeah that's amazing um, regarding the towards the end of your comments, they're talking about rewriting portions at least and modernizing, upgrading things in the water remanagement plan. And your comments about the listing of priorities after getting data and information and having listings of priorities. You kind of said, well, somebody wanted number A, but we haven't done number three yet. I believe we need to continue to be flexible, get number one done, number two. By the time you get to number three, man, it may not be the priority anymore. And we have to be yeah. flexible enough that, hey, man, eight might have come up to number two by now. And so we can't just go by the numbers and definitely always yeah. take it one by one, but having a list of priorities and working through it, but being flexible and always reevaluating, revisiting the list and where other projects may drop off or come rise up. Yeah, no, I didn't mean that. Yeah. <laughs> it does give you a good place to start though. Yeah. Um, so that as things change, yes. you you have a way of circling back That's to right. where things were. Yeah, if something falls out, you gotta back up. Yeah, exactly. Oh, another other, good presentation. Too. Any Thanks. other suggestions or kind of questions? Sounds like the committee okay. likes what you're doing. Do you so we'll any other uh, actions. I uh, no. I think our next action will um, will be coordinating with the city. And I I know uh, for the budget request, traditionally the city just does one, and the the county has not brought ours um, unless there's a specific item. Um, so I think what we'll we'll have is we'll have the city letter and we'll have the county note about the um, you know how we think we want to get started. I think that's what everyone can expect for October, and we'll, um, so we'll see kind of go from there. So okay. Our next item is the discussion of the state of the watershed event. All right, that one is also me. All right, so um, another kind of item that's been in discussion between staff and, of the county and the city is an idea of a state of the watershed um, event. And um, I, um, something I mean, Freddie and I and um, Chia may have discussed, um, you know, what, and I think, um, you know, obviously we're bringing it in front of the committee as a discussion item. Um, would definitely like your thoughts here. Um, this is something we'd like to do this fall um, and you know the goal would be to educate the public interested stakeholders and local leaders about slow creek um, and the role that the city and county have in managing and stewarding the creek and the watershed um, and it also could potentially um, be a kind of a kickoff a public kickoff for um, the water management plan update and i Right now, our kind of current thought, um, you know, is it, it's a would be, you know, a, what I guess would be a very big presentation um, with the Q and A after kind of reviewing um, what is uh, Zone Nine, the watershed, uh, kind of some topics that Wayne had gone through here um, in the meeting earlier, and um, giving that background, histories, context. Um, 
what I have just kind of called the, the WMP era. So what's been the last, you know, what happened in 1995, what it caused, what's been done since, um, where, you know, kind of what has been our running paradigm. And, um, and then looking, kind of widening that from the water management plan, what has been done and is being done just across um, public agencies and private entities, NGOs. Um, as I referenced earlier, there's been a ton of work done and I think it should be highlighted. Um, and I think our, our thought here would be, you know, land conservancy, you come share five, 10 minutes on a rondo removal and we get creek lands to come up and talk about the projects they've worked on and the things they are working on and invite um, some of these entities and uh, again, who have been working in the creek um, to share about the things they're doing and introduce themselves, um, you know, maybe to new people who don't know them. Um, and then we would get into what's next, which would be the water management plan update um, and potentially a, a, like flood preparedness. Like we've had some discussion about, um, you know, how do, could we do a flood preparedness day? I like that idea, John, um, could, you know, the flood gate program in the city in the downtown area, um, you know, try to get what resources are available, but also what is, you know, kind of expected of, you know, um, of private property owners, um, what do the agencies do? What do they not do? Um, you know, things like that. And then we would have a Q and A. Um, I had a picture of the octagon barn up because I was thinking that's where we would do it. Uh, not actually in the barn because there's no tech set up in there. So we would do it in, I believe it's called the milking parlor, um, which is off to the side. And, um, you know, kind of that's been my, my thought. Um, we, I don't think we can have it reserved yet. Um, but these are these are a couple of thoughts we had about the event, and I'd be open to. A, we would like to hear any thoughts, comments. This is stupid. It's a great idea, um, and uh, you know, I guess do do you think it would be valuable to do? Um, do you think you know it'd be worth everyone's time, so to speak? Um, I see it as a way for the committee and for staff to kind of put a point in the timeline of we are we are looking ahead and here's what we're working on, you know, and it kind of established this, um, you know, there, I haven't found the perfect word yet, but it's it's like, it's a point in time. It's a, it's a stake in the ground of uh, we're looking ahead and here's what we're doing uh, or would like to do. Um, so this is the event we've, we've discussed. Again, we're, we'd like to do it this fall. Um, and uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to anyone if you would like to add anything, Freddie, and then we could go from there. <clears throat> so this is something that you know I've wanted to do for a number of years. You know, I mean, we used to provide council an update um, for um, you know winter proper every year, just kind of like what we've done in the previous uh, couple of months to get ready for um, winter time, and taking that you know and, and um, really expanding the scope and, and the presentation. Um, this year, especially um, with all the emergency projects that we've got going on, um, I think it would be an amazing presentation to the community. You know, just, okay, so at San Luis Drive, we've got you know this big huge project going there. Um, down at um, the Elks Lane Elks Lodge, here we've got a big huge project going there. Johnson and Pismo, we have another emergency project going on there. We're looking at the Mark Street Bridge as an emergency project to dig up the United Center. Um, all these all these projects that are happening that you know, people drive by and are impacted by the traffic or whatever, but they don't know the big picture of what's going on. Um, in relation to the waterway management plan, um, the, the current plan, you know, what that forecasted, what the city is implementing right now, and then you know, what we're looking at in the long view for the future to continue to make these improvements. Um, like I say, I've, been, I've wanted to do this for years, um, just to get in front of the community and, and tell them this is what we are doing. Um, just to have you know that that put, putting that out there um, instead of saying well you you city people you just don't do anything <laughs> we're doing a lot um, and so getting that out from the community I think I'm excited. I, I always found that because the city council meetings are broadcast and I think the board meetings are broadcast mm -hmm. that those venues the proletariat citizenry are likely to see and hear such a presentation as you try to get handled. I'm wondering who this would be.
focus towards would it be invitations to the board of supervisors the city councils all the advisory bodies uh the, the sigma group out in edna valley uh <coughs> cal poly uh I, I, I mean who who is the target here uh, the the person off the street do you expect them to come i'd be skeptical and that uh, yet we want to reach them and this won't be broadcast to where they can see it and just talking to the board or supervisors or advisory bodies or whatever isn't going to get it out to every Tom, Dick, and Harry on the street, whether it's on BB Street or over on Ocean Air or whatever, they're not going to see it. So I'm wondering how valuable this would be towards helping the community deal with things that the everyday man who doesn't know who they're the ones driving around and seeing the construction, they have these questions, start digging up someplace, they don't know what's going on and they don't know how to find out. This isn't going to get to them, that's my opinion, right off the bat. Now, I like the idea, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure who this is going to serve and it's going to get the information that we want to share out to the residents who are not particularly tied in to any of the official discussions anywhere. So we've got a communications team at the city, and so working with them um, to get that information out there, you know, via KSBY, via um, through city council or supervisors meetings, forecasting the date and you know a brief description of the event, um, going through the different social media platforms and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like I say, just getting it out in front of as many people as possible. Are we going to reach everybody? No. Um, but you know, people that I think are interested and concerned. <laughs> Um, those are the people that may be more willing to attend. And so, like I say, getting it out on different platforms. Um, I'm still the old school. I watch KSBY you know, every night, five o'clock. So, um, you know, talking with the folks there. In our internal conversations around what this event could look like, I think there were two paths that we thought about taking. And this one was that we're presenting is more of a technical approach where we're going to be talking about the specifics of updating this planning document that's 300 pages long, what that entails. And I think there's a lot of room for broader community awareness and education around flooding. And I think that that event might be a different event that talks about uh, what you can do if you have a business in a flood zone or if your house is in a flood zone. It might like have kid friendly activities and be during an accessible time of day, but it won't be a two hour long uh, lecture presentation. And so just wanna say that there's room for both. And I think that this particular event uh, has a purpose and is, is like right size for what we needed to do, but that doesn't mean it should also provide other opportunities for the community to learn. Thank you for that. Cause yeah. that was what I was gonna ask too, is like, what's the format of this? and to try and wrap my head around who the audience would be like should we be sending out postcards to all the neighborhoods and, and, you know like is it that or is it it's more of the technical expert um government ngo sort of yeah collaborator focus totally there's folks who come to these meetings regularly who are particularly impacted private property owners and i would mm -hmm. say would be those type of interested stakeholders, but probably a wider band of them would attend if you have space to accommodate 20 to 30 of those stakeholders. Um, so kind of that middle band too of, of folks who recently experienced flood damage and already know that this committee exists and that it can be used to help solve their problems. But I would second the Second, the idea of doing a more publicly facing in you know event in the fall that's a little more educational, how to fill the sandbags, where to find the sand, and what to do with your flood lakes. Make sure you're not putting product on them in your stores so they're ready to use when you need them. That sort of thing um, would be great in that time frame too. Great before it starts raining. I've got a little different perspective because I'm only here. I started, I just looked at my notes. I started coming here in 2018. 
And that was a result of the flooding that we had happening at Batchel and Buckley for 40 years we've lived there. And then the Avila Ranch is coming in with a big development. And it's like, okay, what are you going to do about this? So that's what got me here. And I've been pretty well attending pretty regularly ever since. But there's a lot of different people who have attended this meeting over the years that live out in our area. Nobody had ever heard his own night. I had never heard his own night, and Wayne's a good friend. So, you know, it just never, it never came up. And I think after the rain last year, and now they're talking about another rain next year, we'll see if it happens. But I think people have a very heightened awareness, more so than usual. And those of us that are out on property, we have different, we have all kinds of uh, issues. We're not on a street where the water's coming up and coming to our door. We don't have that problem, but we have a lot of other problems. So, um, you know, I, what I have, I've learned a lot here over the years. And what I have found really interesting is, is the whole creek thing, the whole, the way San Luis is built on creeks. You know, what other town is set up like that? And they all go to Avalo Beach. I find that just so interesting. And there's, if, if I'm correct, there's two points. Um, the intersection of 101 and South Higuera, where all the city creeks come there on their way to Avila. And then on our whole side of Buckley, they all come down and that's what the East Fork study was about because then they take off to Avila. And then at some point it all converges before it, I guess, goes under the freeway. But that's a lot of water. And, and it, it's just interesting to understand. I think that would be an interesting presentation just for people to understand. You know, we don't have sewers that take water who knows where. Um, you know, it's, we just have a, have a different system. And just understanding that, I think, helps to, to kind of picture everything. Now, my only other comment is, I see the East Fork is off the agenda. So you said the study's done. So are we no longer talking about the East Fork? That, specifically that as a project i would say no, no but it's still an issue I, and is it going to be followed up or okay I, Freddie I, his head. the committee yeah, it's the, not solved no 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 they, they okay. still here i'm not going some assurance <laughs> the committee the committee recommended to keep up on maintenance um at, you know to keep up on the maintenance of that area it's, it's okay. really important to okay. you know maintain can I call it a success? The, the, the way it worked last year was progress. Thank you. Well, it wasn't. Uh, I wouldn't call it success last I was, year. Well, progress in the sense of it's, I think it was much better than it had been in the past. Well, I think you and identified so, the problem, but we haven't fixed the problem yet. The, the flooding was still huge on the Stickler's property, huge. So. It, so that's, you know, it's, it's, yeah, anyway, I don't know, yeah. but, but I just wouldn't call it solved. Did you, Wayne? Nobody, nobody here at this committee I've heard has called it solved. I mean, okay. it's, it's, it's an ongoing issue, ongoing maintenance, okay. um, CCC, et cetera, et cetera, and it's, it, it's on the agenda long term. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Can't fix it overnight, it's not going to happen. I think Freddie will probably talk about it in item number six because oh, yeah. of updates of what's yeah, happening. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't see it, so I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think the challenge of this event will be to get people to come. Yeah. I agree. I mean, they, they, yeah. you know, no one that worries about flooding until they're flooded. Yeah. I think that the neighbors in the area that you're talking about would mm -hmm. be good candidates to come yeah. to the the less pu less public event, the more technical event, because they are very invested in their dealing with it on a day to day basis and know what they need to be prepared for and want to have input. Yeah, and have, want, to have, yeah. want to have want to have input into the watershed. But I'm thinking of the promotion for this event. You're going to have to refocus on why you should come because it's you know the advantage of being at the meeting 
in learning some things that will help you when when any flooding occurs in your property. You know, one I one idea I had, and I mean, I didn't present it. It's not where we went, but um, like Lucia mentioned, we did talk about some different formats or ideas. You know, another thought. It's like, could this be like a a, a glorified zone nine advisory committee meeting? You know, where we just really get out in front of the public, or try to get out and invite more people. Maybe do it in a different spot, but you know, we do it in the context of a meeting. Um, is another. You know, if we're going to do it more, the more technical one could be done within a meeting. I think that's something we discussed as well. Um, again, that's not what I totally presented here, but could be, could be done. There's a number of venues we could use, and, you know, uh, trying to decide, you know, daytime, nighttime, midweek, weekend, you know, it's um, the who's your audience comes in. I think you all these are trying to figure out. Visuals like, and I mean like this, you have to have some pictures of flooding. Absolutely. Some of those pictures we've got downtown with the water mm -hmm. rolling down to High Pier Street. Uh, in the creeks down there at the funeral, where it was, you know, you the big walk and horizontal waves, we call those longitudinal waves, are really signs of huge velocities. Um, that stuff's kind of exciting to see when you, if you haven't ever seen it, and get, it should get your attention. But uh, getting that and then and explain what why this happens and you know it's going to take it's going to take a lot of effort on somebody to put this together to be a really good event that's that's the part i, I, I feel we would be challenged with yeah i think the timing mm -hmm. i think is the most difficult part so october is a couple months away maybe it feels like a lot but it's not it's the concept to go on yeah <laughs> two months away i don't disagree I kind of like that idea of the daytime thing, like a, a rack or a zone nine. We did a joint meeting one time. Big room at the library, for instance, gives you opportunity for people who are downtown during the day or, or who have the ability to go to meetings during the afternoon time instead of in the evening if they live out of town or if it wants to come to town and go to the nighttime meeting again. You know, ha, ha, ha. Just thinking out loud here, but maybe the kinds of people we were talking about inviting that maybe would be more amenable to come to an afternoon thing in town, a meeting kind of thing. This is part of their job, perhaps. Right, exactly. Yeah. That they're on an advisory body, they're on the stigma, they're on, you know, anything that has to do with water around in this zone. Um, it's going to be a special meeting here that we're going to talk about all these and get this out in the press to all the different um, media that we can. Um, that there's going to be meeting to learn how to protect yourself before the next big rain. Here's what you know: sandbags and gates and um, hardening your landscapes. I mean, and whatever kind of thing that you put out there, but perhaps. And I, I, I'm certainly saying I would sign up for that before I'd sign up for a seven o'clock and you going out. I just don't do that much anymore. You know, I don't, don't go out. I don't know. I, I'll go to a daytime meeting, though. And maybe it, it's depending on who we're addressing and who we're trying to attract, who we want to speak to, that, that might be better set up in that. So the agenda would be a unique agenda, not the typical one of these agendas, but a agenda basically talks about the histories and what we're doing and where we're going and what you need to know to take care of yourself. I agree with that and, and that might help us be able to attract a supervisor or two or a council member or two or different professional organizations downtown association, different groups that are in the area, including Avila Advisory Body. Do we think a flood preparedness event focus would be maybe more appropriate for this fall? Rather than maybe like kind of like what I what I had talked about. This was more on the you know planning technical side. 
um, you know, but I've heard now, you know, obviously what you just said and others, maybe, maybe a flood preparedness event would be more appropriate. Flood preparedness and, and your flood and conservation district. It's headed by your flood and conservation district or, um, but that, that may be, be something at, at this late date, as it were, if we're going to have something this fall that might be a little easier to package quickly. Yeah, I was hesitating to say one thing or the other because it sounded like you were kind of going down two parallel paths, one that's a more technical uh, seminar and one that's more of a community preparedness event. Mm -hmm. if, if you had limited resources and don't feel like you can do both, then, then maybe the latter is the more important before it starts raining. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, too technical, you know, trying to have a meeting with a technical thing. Really, I mean, that's that's kind of a stretch to think that there's going to be more than your usual suspects going and, to something like that. I think. In which case, if we're talking about a more community-facing event that might have some of the mm -hmm. other population at it too, then I might think of a late afternoon, early evening, before it gets too late, but also so that we can capture some of the people that that do live on the in the mid high air corridor that are working during the day and can come by right at 5 or 5 30 or something like that. Yeah, I like that idea. It's like flood preparedness. And, oh, by the way, there's a whole committee who talks about this frequently and we do projects and services. Yeah, we could do like 10 minutes on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. like, hey, if you're yeah. interested, come to our meetings, yes. you know, then we get see who comes and then, you know, yeah. based on the interest gauge right. from that 10 minute, 20 minute segment of the flood preparedness yeah. meeting. Yeah. Then we see what the interest is in something more technical. Yeah, state of the water, expand yeah. watershed. Um, we have old plans, water water management plans that we need to update. Um, that we want to give you to all the ways you can prepare, look ahead for the coming rainy season. No, make it a blend of things without getting too yeah. technically heavy yeah. for the labor. Too, so. might be good. Yeah, some technical element like what are the flood zones? What are the creeks, right? Because people in BB didn't even know they were in a flood zone, for instance. Yeah. And so yeah. now they know, but you know, a lot of people don't. <laughs> so getting the high level, like, ooh, this is where flooding has occurred historically. Yeah. Um, and this yeah. is why it happens. Is, you know, this is what we're trying to do to mitigate it. it seems like it'd be better in November than in October. Yeah. People are starting thinking more about rain in November than they are in October. Yeah. It gives me a couple extra weeks. <laughs> Technically, yeah, it should start raining in October. <laughs> as long as you don't get too close to Thanksgiving, then people start checking out. But I think you're saying the first week or two. Yeah. And if you wanted to, if you wanted to pursue kind of Freddie's idea of the state of the watershed, you know, a more mandatory program as a state of bay every four years. So, you know, not a whole lot happened in the recent year, but every four years, there's usually a lot to present on. And it kind of migrated from where it's just one day of all presentations to a, a week where there's different things going on. So you, have, mm. you could have some more community focused and kid friendly things that might attract other people. And then during that same week, like, oh, and here's some technical talks on these things that you can come attend to. So you, you cast a bigger net of who's interested in yeah. making a celebration of the watershed. Yeah. Well. Yeah, we've got 25 years to catch up on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. Any further discussions on them? It's three o'clock now. Um, we're going to the updates area. I wonder if the updates people are ready to go. Can I hear a bypass? Meeting, but we are making some progress with our regulatory permits with the county. Uh, there's been a little bit of back and forth with um, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, so we're excited to be hopefully receiving a permit pretty soon and have done everything the Army Corps of Engineers has asked for. Um, so hoping to get those permits and 
we have a 95% plan set that we are routing for everybody's comments, uh, taking a look at it with Freddie, the county, applying for our building permit for uh, grading work and uh, doing all our internal review. So we're still have a ways to go on property easement acquisition, but they can cover us there as well. We have one signed easement Tonight. and several others in discussion for some you know, negotiations and then also uh, just got all the rest of the legal descriptions for all the temporary easements needed. So we're making progress and we're just continuing on. Do you construction? The construction is still slated for 2024. Um, we have to get through all those items and get it out for advertising, um, hopefully late fall, early winter. But construction will start in the dry season of 24. Also working uh, on some tree removals during the sensitive timing uh, to avoid birds, butterflies, and bats. So um, <laughs> that, that, that work will be likely pulled separately out of the construction contract, which is really great. So we can work with some city um, on-call consultants in order to get a little head start on 2024. So that work is slated for uh, late 2023. I like that, the three E's. Yeah. Are we friends? Questions, anyway? Thank you. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Creek maintenance. So we are, we have been very active um, since January 10th, um, looking and documenting, looking at the creek and documenting where we've had problems. Uh, identifying emergency products that need to be implemented. Um, have a list of about 13. Um, two or three of the smaller ones have already been completed. We're still under construction on San Luis Drive right now um, for another couple of months. Um, still looking at implementing um, hopefully another four or five this year uh, before it starts raining and then phasing um, other projects as well. Um, we've done quite a bit of, we did quite a bit of cleanup after the storms. Um, this past winter. And so that has been, has, has been super helpful in not having to do as much extensive cleanup debris removal work this year to get ready for the winter season. Um, my flood control technicians should be back on board within the next couple of weeks. And so sending them out on smaller project areas just to make sure that you're checking the bridges, the culverts, our typical hot spots, and making sure those are clear and ready to go for the upcoming winter. Um, the Marsh Street Bridge is one that we we're really pushing for um, with all the accumulated sediment that we've seen after the storms, but also um, the stabilized soils from the gravel bar upstream of the bridge and then downstream of the bridge as a component of the Mehagir Bypass project that we're going to be pulling out and doing um, as an emergency project this year um, with the flooding that we had January 9th. Um, capacity has been reduced about 30%. Um, in under the bridge. It's only a 15 year capacity bridge. Um, with the 25 year measure we had in January, um, we ended up spilling. So, because they got that main last tree in there. My, my one last sycamore. I, 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 I had to leave one. <laughs> I had to leave one, Christine. Come on. Um, yes, yeah, so that gravel bar will get completely removed um, down to six inches to a foot above slow line. Um, the big cottonwoods on the downstream side will be removed as well and opening up the East Barrel, um, which has never had work done as far as I've been here. Um, so really improving capacity there um, to complement the Medicare bypass project. Um, like I said, that was a component of the project anyways. Um, for Fimo Creek, we're going to um, look at realigning um, the mouth for Fimo Creek as it comes to Laguna Lake to help with conveyance. Right now it makes four 90 degree turns before it gets into the lake. That's problematic um, from a conveyance point of view. So we're looking at doing that emergency project this year and then phasing um, out the next two years to make additional capacity improvements in the Rafino farm where we did experience flooding um, because the streets couldn't drain just because of the accumulated sediment and the amount of water coming down through there. Um, as we get down to East Fork, um, we were able to complete two projects last year, um, having the CCCs work in um, Tame Farm Creek and East Fork proper there was one section in the middle that we didn't get to, and then downstream of that project, we had the opportunity for a fuel reduction project to occur. 
same basic principles, removing the down material from the pre-channel uh, to prevent ignitions. Um, but there was that one section in the middle that we didn't get to. Um, so, you know, working with the county staff, getting back out there to see, you know, what debris has come down um, from further up both those creek systems and figure out what maintenance needs to be done this year. Um, I wasn't able to secure the CCCs until December. Um, they're a hot commodity right now. So looking at crew capacity is something that we've been talking with um, the county about um, just because the seas are, they're becoming more problematic to secure. The inmate crews um, are also um, problematic to secure. So looking at, you know, what other out-of-the-box ideas can we come up with um, for a maintenance program that's more holistic in the entire watershed, city and county land. Um, so those are discussions that we're continuing to have to figure out capacity. Um, tree contractors uh, as a stopgap measure, we'll have tree contractors out in East Fork um, if we see large debris jams or whatever, just to remove as much of those, those threats as possible um, in advance of winter time. Um, and I'll be in touch with um, Kim um, about that as well. Okay. So, questions? Good. 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 Yes, thank you. Good. All right. So, um, hopefully, we're, um, we're, we're getting close to it, but we're anticipating Monday. Starting to remove the Arundo at Los Valley Road, where that bridge is. It's been quite a coordination effort. Right? It's been helping us a lot, trying to figure out how to uh, get the homeless community to move out so we can safely do the work and uh, stay out long enough for us to follow up with our side treatments. So, um, the same kind of issues for you. We, we were lucky, we were able to get the CCC's uh, crew for four days. Um, uh, so we have them Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. We're going to get as much work done as we can, biomass removal, and then a month later in September, we'll follow up and um, spray everything with herbicide and everything that the seeds aren't able to get. We'll spray with herbicide too. It'll just be, you know, still be dying, but it'll be just kind of some in-place biomass. Um, so yeah, that'll be the bulk of our work this year. We're really planning it. This is our our kind of golden window to try and focus on this one population that's been plaguing us since forever. Um, so, <laughs> um, so hopefully everything goes smooth, but you know, as these things go, when you get down to the logistics, things get really um, harder as you get closer to the data, especially when you're dealing with homeless populations because there's a, there's a human factor to it. And, uh, and that, that can affect schedules outside of our control. So we'll see. Fingers crossed and uh, looking forward. If you guys are driving that way next week, um, Monday you'll see two big um, roll off dumpsters on uh, in that way, mm -hmm. that way's property. And, uh, and hopefully we'll get a big tent out of there. Okay. Any questions? Back and forth. Yeah, um, wanted to, um, this is a, like I mentioned earlier, we're going to start reporting on um, an Apple study. The county received um, ARPA funds, the Rescue, American Rescue, Rescue Plan. Plan Act. Uh, one of the projects we got in there was looking at flooding in Avila. Um, the, this is in the parking lot there. I believe it's First Street and San Francisco Street. Um, right near Avila Beach Drive, in the parking lot there, it floods often. Um, and there is a drainage um, that goes under Avila Beach uh, Drive. It's got a, um, a special kind of outlet on it. So when the creek is really high, it should not be, you know, water, water won't be backing up from the creek into the parking lot. But um, if you've been out there and you, you know, you look around, you're like, why is this parking lot the lowest point here? Um, you know, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't here, so I'll, I'll use that one. You know, no one asked me how to design it, but um, obviously it's a, it's a big problem. And um, so uh, we have, again, we have ARPA funds. We are studying, um, you know, what, uh, make sure we obviously fully understand the issues 
um, set some goals and then start um, the first stage of 30% design drawings of a selected alternative. Um, and so we plan to bring project updates of this um, to this committee and um, we'll be letting, um, you know, part of the outreach to the Avila Valley Advisory Council is letting them know, you know, this is the venue we're gonna be doing that. Hopefully they'll, they'll get involved in some way. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's what we've, that's what we got. We're just kicking it off. Um, you know, this summer. So we would be using the data and the plans we prepared for some of the year. Um, if it's a relevant information about the Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's the update. Any questions on that one? Public comment. No additional public comment about something that's not on the agenda. Uh, Future agenda items. Anybody have a suggestion for a future agenda item they'd like to see? We're too good at getting agenda items. What's that? We have too many good ideas for agenda items. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. well, we took care of more of the day. Great discussions today. Yeah, that's a good meeting. Next meeting is October 11th at 1 30. Uh, same place, same station. Yeah, we'll discuss the budget request. And we'll have the budget request, right? Yeah. If there's nothing else that anybody has to say, we'll return the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.